Yes, if you think biological complexity can, can come about through the unplanned emergence and need not and not need an intelligent designer, then why would you think human society needs an intelligent government? Ooh, that's a fun question. Alrighty, I'm back. Whoops, knocked the microphone in the process. Um, this article crossed my, crossed my radar from uh, the Wall Street Journal, an opinion piece that came out over the weekend. And um, it was really interesting to me because it is something, as I've said for a long time, viewers of this channel know I am a scientist. I do work in academia. Um, and, and there's interesting things here that I do hear from some of my colleagues that, you know, People have lost trust in the experts. Why do people think they can do without the experts? Uh, da, 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 da. Unfortunately, not a whole heck of a lot of introspection on their part, I don't think. Um, but I want to point something out because there's one thing I, I, I got to make a note of with this particular article. And I think there's a good nuance to this that's missing both um, from some from this article, but also from others and it would be just good to talk about it and lay it out there and also give you my thoughts reading this article being who I am um both a uh, commenting on science on the internet but also as you know my day job is as a scientist doing research day in and day out on all the good stuff so how science lost the public's trust from climate to covid politics and hubris have disconnected scientific institutions from the philosophy and methods that once that ought to guide them um, and I'm not going to pronounce the author's name. I don't know how to pronounce it, so I'm not going to try. Appreciate it, but I'm not going to try. <laughs> um, let's see. Science has become a political catchword. I believe in science, tweeted Joe Biden tweeted six days before he was elected president. Donald Trump doesn't. It's that simple, folks. All right. Prior video on this channel will tell you why I hate that phrase, believe in science. Go back there. But what does it mean to believe in science? Again, no. British science writer Matt Ridley draws a pointed distinction between science as a philosophy and science as an institution. The former grows out of the Enlightenment, which Mr. Ridley defines as the primacy of rational and objective reasoning. The latter, like all human institutions, is erratic, prone to falling sh well short of its stated principles. Mr. Ridley says the COVID pandemic has thrown into sharp relief the disconnect between science as a philosophy and science as an institution. Mr. Ridley, 63, describes himself as a science critic, which is a profession that doesn't really exist. He likens the, his vocation to that of an art critic and dismisses most other science writers as cheerleaders. That somewhat lofty attitude seems fitting for a hereditary English peer. As the fifth Vicomte Ridley, I think I'm saying that right, he's a member of the British of Britain's House of Lords, and he zooms with me from his ancestral seat in Northumberland, just south of Scotland, in between sessions of Parliament, which he also attends by Zoom. I will say, um, I, I actually agree with the assessment that most of science writers are actually cheerleaders. <laughs> <laughs> um, and cheerleaders in particular when, when science vindicates their position or can be used to vindicate their position. Um, we do need some science critics. So, Mr. Ridley, if you ever see this, good on you. I am happy to have you be a critic of science, particularly as an institution. I'm getting very critical myself as I go on. <clears throat> At Oxford, nearly 40 years... Okay, well, that's just some of his background. Um, okay. With the Canadian molecular biologist Alina Chan, he's finishing a book called Viral, The Search for the Origin of COVID-19, to be published in November. It will likely make its authors unwelcome in China. As Mr. Ridley worked on the book, he says it became horribly clear that Chinese scientists are not free to explain and reveal everything they have been doing with bat viruses. That information has to be dug out by outsiders like him and Ms. Chan. The Chinese authorities, he says, ordered all scientists to send their results relevant to the virus for approval by the government before other scientists or international agencies could vet them. That is a shocking, that is shocking in the aftermath of a lethal pandemic that has killed millions and devastated the world. Now, just, just, um, for point of order here, I do not know if what Mr. Ridley claims and as written by this author has, um, been put here. I do not know if that's true offhand. I haven't been able to confirm it. So I will just put that caveat there. Mr. Ridley notes that the question of COVID's origin has, quote, mostly been tackled by people outside the mainstream scientific establishment. People inside not only have been disappointingly incurious, 
but have tried to shut down the inquiry to protect the reputation of science as an institution. The most obvious reason for this resistance, if COVID leaked from a lab, and especially if it developed there, science finds itself in the dark. And, you know, that's a fair concern, I think. Um, the problem with that is you need to be about the truth and transparency. One of the norms of science and the philosophy side of things is transparency. Other factors have been at play as well. Scientists are sensitive about other elite, as other elites to charges of racism, which the Communist Party used to evade questions about specifically Chinese practices, such as the trade in wildlife for food or lab experiments or on bat coronaviruses in the city of Wuhan. I think I remember hearing that actually at one point that the, that the uh, that you were that you were called yeah that you were called racist if you if you questioned that or went after that um, and something. I wouldn't doubt the Chinese Communist Party would use that. I have no respect for them. Um, no trust in them to not use whatever they can. Scientists are a global guild, and the Western scientific community has, quote, come to have a close relationship and even reliance on China. Scientific journals derive considerable input and income from China, and Western universities rely on Chinese students and researchers for their tuition, revenue, and manpower. All that said, Mr. Ridley, all that Mr. Ridley says may have to change in the wake of the pandemic. Um, I, I would have to go look at the admissions records, actually, for um, admissions breakdowns by demographics, but I believe that's actually correct, that there are a lot of Asian students um, that get into U.S. universities. I don't think they're entirely the largest um, group um, that get into universities from international settings in particular. I don't think that's the case, but I'm not 100%. Um, in the UK, he has also noted a tendency to admire authoritarian Chinese chi authoritarian China among scientists that surprised some people. Didn't surprise Mr. Ridley. I've noticed for years, he says, that scientists take a somewhat top-down view of the political world, which is odd if you think how beautifully bottom-up the evolutionary view of the natural world is. Very true, actually. A uh, very true statement, I do believe. <clears throat> Yes, if you think biological complexity can, can come about through the unplanned emergence and need not and not need an intelligent designer, then why would you think human society needs an intelligent government? Ooh, that's a fun question. Science as an institution has a naive belief that if only scientists were in charge, they would run the world well. Perhaps what politicians mean when they when they declare they believe in science. As we've seen during the pandemic, science can be a source of power. Okay, this comment right here, actually, I this is a lot of what I was trying to get at in an early video on this channel on the difference between elitism and empathy. And I do think there is a problem that scientists have um, as an institution in particular, and those who've been doing it for a very long time, um, that they view themselves as if they were in charge, if people just listened to the experts, everything would be great. <laughs> if people just listened to the experts, if the experts were in charge, it would be great. And I do recall hearing uh, when Angela Merkel became chancellor of Germany. Um, yeah, I think she's, I think her technical title is chancellor. I apologize if I get it wrong. Um, <laughs> th there was a lot of cheering for her because she does have a PhD herself, Angela Merkel. Um, but I looked at that and it was like, so? <laughs> Having a PhD doesn't make you a good leader um, here. And this whole commentary about, you know, the sci if scientists were in charge, they would run the world. That goes all the way back to Plato. Plato was very much in favor of having philosopher kings, um, thinking that the educated class should be the ones ruling the world, the ones with the most education can make the best decisions and all this kind of stuff. And Aristotle argued the opposite point. So Plato, Plato definitely uh, plays into this here when we're talking about that. And it is a very naive belief, actually, because that doesn't, having expert knowledge does not make you any less prone to temptation. It doesn't make you any less prone to any of that. And as I've said, being a scientist and practicing doing science as a philosopher, doing science itself and, and and working through the process of science, it does not make you any less likely to err. Let's put it that way. Um, because science and practice of science does not give you a moral compass. It does not give you right and wrong um, here, aside from, you know, the philosoph philosophical practice of science where, you know, you're in pursuit of the truth, 
you have universalism, you're not supposed to judge research based on anything other than the merits and the logic and what have you and all the guiding inquiry principles and all that kind of stuff. You can go back in prior videos on my channel if you want all of that. But science doesn't give you a moral compass. I've said it over and over and over again. And you cannot presume that it does. And that does that right there immediately means that even though somebody has expertise in something and is a high-level scientist, perhaps, they would not be the best ones if they were in charge. And I do believe there is a lot of, in my young career, seeing a lot of hubris there, actually, amongst scientists. I can understand that. And I keep trying to say this to people myself in that... If you are putting on the air of hubris, you don't even have to be saying it. You should trust me because I'm the expert. But if you're putting on the air of condescension and arrogance and hubris, when you are talking with somebody who's not a scientist, trying to get them to listen to you, they will immediately turn off because people can pick up on what you're communicating with your body language. A lot of communication is body language. And so there's a hubris there. <laughs> if your hubris is there in your body language, people are going to pick it up and probably will view it negatively. Um, here, so let's see. There's a tension between scientists wanting to present a uni unified and authoritative voice on one hand and science as a philosophy, which is obligated to remain open-minded and pr be prepared to change its mind. Mr. Ridley fears that the pandemic has, for the first time, seriously politicized epidemiology. It's partly the fault of outside commentators who hustle scientists in, in political directions. I think it's also the fault of epidemiologists themselves del deliberately punish publishing things that fit with their political prejudice or ignoring things that don't. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm worried about that for epidemiology too. I, I do think the pandemic and, and the responses to it and how it's been treated and how it's been pushed by different actors and what have you has definitely pushed it in a way to be politicized. Um, I'm going to go down here a little bit. Um, yeah. Mr. Ridley sides a later camp. One motivation, pessimism sells. You get blamed for being too pessimistic, but you get do get attention. It's like climate science model for you. Uh, the late science fiction movie hated the tendency to describe the outcome models in words that imply they are the results of an experiment that frames speculation as if it were proof. Um, climate science is already far down the road to politicization. 20 or 30 years ago, you could study the Ice Ages, how the Ice Ages happened, and discuss competing theories without being political about it. Now it's hard to have conversation on the subject without people trying to interpret it through a political lens. Um, uh, okay. I, I don't know that I want to do too much on that, though I do believe... Um, I, I will say there's politicization there, yes. And I'm saying this is both a climate scientist and a conservative. It certainly is there in my short career that I've seen that it is very difficult at times for me to... I do I do get a sense, though nobody will come right out and say it, I do get a sense that I don't get taken anywhere near seriously at times. And that could be in my own head, but it could also be because perception isn't always reality. Um, but it could also be that it literally don't get taken seriously as a conservative, which... Whatever, it's not my job to please them, it's my job to tell the truth on whatever I research. And I happen to research the climate models myself, actually, <laughs> and the climate projections there, so I'm not going to comment that on that here, but um, interestingly enough. <clears throat> climate science has also been infected by cultural relativism, relativism and postmodernism. Uh, Mr. Ridley says he cites a paper that was critical of glaciology, the study of glaciers, because it isn't, wasn't sufficiently fem feminist. I wonder if he's kidding, but Google confirms he isn't. In 2016, Progress in Human Geography published Glaciers, Gender, and Science, a feminist glaciology framework for... <laughs> oh, I'd say I'm surprised by this, but I'm not. Um, like, for example, the climate justice movement. I didn't know about this particular one until just now, but um, the climate ju <laughs> the climate justice movement is another one where it is a perversion of science and it is connected very much with postmodernism. I do not support it in the slightest um, right now. <clears throat> You're going to get away from being perverted the way it is before I'm going to support that. The politicization of science leads to a loss of confidence in science as an institution. The distrust may be justified, but leaves a vacuum, often filled by a much more superstitious approach to knowledge. To such superstition, Mr. Ridley attributes public resistance to technologies such as genetically modified food, nuclear power, and vaccines. Um, well, part of the resistance to nuclear power actually is the fear factor. 
there was there was genuinely a lot of fear put out there of nuclear meltdown going back to the bomb and what have you and things with Chernobyl and the, uh, like that and Chernobyl was more more the problem was the proper safety mechanisms were not followed and that build the building it was in was a whole huge ton of a mess um vaccines yeah i can see that at this point if you spurn the covid-19 vaccination mr ridley says that he would fervently argue that it is the lesser of two risks at least for adults the ample data to show that for this vaccine and for others going back centuries he calls vaccination probably the most massive and incredible benefit of scientific knowledge, yet it's counterintuitive and difficult to understand, which may explain why its advocates have been vilified through the centuries. Um, well, I mean, I can say for the specific thing with the COVID-19, there's a lot of concern that it was it was rushed through. It's experimental. There's a lot of stories coming out about um, <clears throat> coming out about different. Um, Oh, shoot. Coming out about different adverse reactions people have had. And, you know, they're also saying, well, if you're vaccinated, you still have to wear a mask. Well, what's the point of getting the vaccine? That's the other thing that's going on there. There's lots of communications issues that are not necessarily the fault of the scientist. <clears throat> Vaccines have been central to the question of misinformation and the White House's pressure campaign against social media to censor it. Mr. Ridley worries that about the opposite problem, that social media is complicit in enforcing conformity. It does this through fact-checking, mob pylons, and direct censorship, now explicitly at the behest of the Biden administration. He points out that Facebook and Wikipedia long banned any mention of the possibility that the virus leaked from a Wuhan lab. That's true, until recently. I think they very recently, Facebook stopped doing that. Um, conformity, Mr. Ridley says, is the enemy of scientific progress, which depends on disagreement and challenge. Science is the belief in the ignorance of experts, as physicist Richard Feynman put it. Mr. Ridley reserves his bluntest criticism for science as a profession, which he says has become rather off-puttingly arrogant and political, permeated by motivated reasoning and confirmation bias. Increasing numbers of scientists seem to fall prey to groupthink, and the process of peer-reviewing and publishing allows dogmatic gatekeeping to get in the way of new ideas and open-minded challenge. I would actually very much agree with this, um, this whole paragraph right here. Because the that is an issue I see coming, and I have been very, very very concerned about it for a very long time myself and and a lot of my fears particularly with the way the university because the university is where we train the next generation of scientists has become very oriented toward groupthink and what i can see um and what i can read and find um and i am genuinely really really worried that as we go too much forward if it's not addressed soon then we will run into the issue of we'll be training a whole group of scientists who who all think the same, who all fall into the same views, who all fall into this group kind of thinking ideology so that when there is somebody who finally challenges it, they're not going to know what to do with it. Um, they're not going to know how to respond when somebody challenges them. So I am particularly really concerned. Um, and he goes in, he's in here talking about um, the World Health Organization and Taiwan, ignoring Taiwan. Let's see. In Mr. Ridley's view, the scientific ex establishment has always had a tendency to turn into a church, enforcing obedience to the latest dogma and expelling heretics and blasphemers. This tendency was previously kept in check by the fragmented nature of scientific enterprise. Professor A, one university, built his career by saying that Professor B's ideas somewhere else were wrong. In the age of social media, however, the space for heterodoxy is evaporating. So those who believe science is a philosophy are increasingly estranged from scientists, science as an institution. It's sure to be a costly divorce. Yeah, um, something I've been thinking about a lot myself. I love science as a philosophy myself. I'm growing, I'm, I'm disenchanted in some ways with science as an institution right now. Um, so I totally understand where Mr. Ridley is coming from with that. Um... Well, there is one thing I want to point out. He is pointing out a very good reason here in why people don't trust uh, science as an institution. Um, and I will give him, give him that because there is an article, oh shoot, I think it was Nathan Kofnos a couple of years ago, um, article that I reviewed, which, which talked about this, where he made a very good point in the article that it's not a mutually inclusive thing to be trusting of science and scientists. In other words... What he meant is you can you can have you can trust that the scientific method is a good way to go about answering questions and the philosophy of science is a good way to go about answering questions, 
But you can also tr have a high level of distrust that scientists are implementing that method appropriately and doing good science. So there is that too. I agree with that, um, that the philosophy is probably good. And most people probably trust the philosophy of science, but it's the scientists who at times, and particularly if they're in established roles and what have you, end up providing a lot of groupthink um, or inadvertently providing a lot of groupthink. They go along to get along sometimes, I think, with the consensus. But I'm just a young hotshot in science. What do I know? Oh, what am I? Be five years out from getting my PhD later this fall? <clears throat> Certainly been interesting. Um, and so, yeah, I can understand that. The other, but the thing is, um, I would actually challenge here, and, and this, this is a way where people, people, the uh, science, science as an institution can very much lose the public trust if it continues to go down the road of being politicized because nobody will trust it at this point. Science was meant to be as one of those neutral arbiters in this case to help us get to the truth so everybody would know what to work with even if they didn't like the results. Um, here is some often don't. <laughs> um... Yeah, it's those who are speaking the truth that everybody hates. Something like that is out there. But um, I want to make a point and point this out because the thing is, so Pew has, Pew is a good example. Um, it's certainly not the only one who's done studies and surveys of, of the public in different parts of the world and whether or not they trust scientists. Um, so there's actually significant minorities. This is the, one of the most recent ones they did specific to science. So this is September of last year, so it's a little older. But you can find other polls out there like this. And actually, majorities have at least some trust in scientists to do what is right. And this includes the U.S. here in this, which this comes out to, oh, it's about 77% in this bar of some or a lot um, here. If I'm doing my math correctly in my head, which... Yes, I'm doing the math correctly, I'm pretty sure, um, in the U.S. So it's not entirely true. And I mean, take it for what you will that, you know, Pew has trust a lot. These are ones who are a lot, from that matter. It's not the other groups in that thing. But take it for what you will that there are different groups that trust more than others. So there is a significant... There is a significant um, portion of the public that actually very much does trust... Um, scientists at the same time. There's a significant majority. That said, I understand what um, Rudley is going for here via the author um, here that you could actually get a lack of trust because of the hubris of scientists involved here who stay in the establishment. They think, well, if if the experts, you know, they they, they they think if we ran the world, if people just listened to us, things would be great. Um, and that's not true. And I said early on in this channel, history, I did an, a video on the experts, and I said, no, I don't think it's a good idea to just blindly trust experts. And I said this knowing I'm a climate scientist myself. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, just because you do hand a tremendous amount of power over to people if you just blindly trust them without getting verification of that. Um, and letting them earn that trust. Um, so that's it. That's my thoughts on this. Um, I'd be curious to hear yours on the topic. Um, this, this is unfortunately behind um, Wall Street Journal's paywall, so I will put the link in there, but if you can get to it, that's, uh, that's the challenge there. But um, So that's it for me, I think. Let me know what you think. If you like this video, I hope you subscribe to the channel, um, and there's more videos like these where that come, came from. Um, I will actually, oh, related to this, I'm actually going to be doing a special video soon, um, hopefully bringing together a group of people to talk exactly on this particular issue with the uh, public trust in sci scientists. <laughs> uh, with the public trust in scientists. So we'll be doing a video on that sometime here in the near future. Um, anywho, I think that's it for now. Um, you can also connect with me on cyworthy.locals.com. Become a supporter there. You can interact with me and other scientists that are there. Um, anyway, that's it for now. I'm Adrian. Um, until next time, stay curious, my friends.